Christine teaches photography here. Uh, Benjamin does not. <laughs> but he's an origami master, all right? And I'll, I will uh, let them take over and tell you how they got started with this, and then whatever they talk about, we will segue into a question and answer, okay? So welcome, uh, Christine and Ben. Good morning. I'm gonna tell you, we're gonna start by talking about, <laughs> about this piece. This was the first piece we made, um, so that's why this is a good starting point for us. Um, this work is made on regular light sensitive photo paper. It's a little bit different than the paper that um, the photo students here are using in the dark room in that it's designed to be folded and it doesn't crack when it's folded. And the reason it doesn't crack is um, it's thinner than the paper you use and also the paper that most people use has, it actually has a clay layer in it. And what that does is it helps the light sensitive part of the paper it hurt, adhere to it, and it has brighteners in it, so it makes a nice white uh, show up in the highlights. So if you, that's the first thing you might notice is different when you look around at the um, exhibition, that you don't have those really bright whites that you're used to seeing when you do your work in the darkroom. So what's happening here is this is a scale model of what the piece looked like. Again, the paper is designed to fold without cracking. I came across this paper and um, thought for a while about what I would do with it. And then I'll tell you exactly how Ben and I um, met in a moment. But um, so if you can imagine, the uh, paper itself is folded. So it's like a photogram. A lot of you have done photograms in your photo class, except there's no object here. It's just the paper itself that's modulating the light and causing these forms and patterns and the illusion of three-dimensionality in the work. So the way this piece was made was um, Ben folded. This is a scale model of what it looked like when the actual photo paper was folded. And then what we did was um, Ben passed it over to me and I exposed it to light. So those of you in photo class, can you tell me what direction the light came in? Anyone from my photo class? No? Okay. You <laughs> okay. Remember, the paper gets darker as it gets, um, as it gets light. The more light it gets, the darker it gets. And the light, as it gets further and further from the light source, it loses, um, it gets dimmer, and it falls off. So the answer is, this one was exposed from here. So it got its darkest, most light here, which meant it got its darkest, and then the light fell off as it came up here, so you have a gray instead of the black. And when this piece was lit in the dark room, it looked like bright right here, and then this area and this area were in shadow. So that's why they're lighter in this piece. Um, and again, this is the first piece uh, Ben and I made together. I came across this paper, and my work is always process-oriented, um, and it's always conceptual. It's based in ideas. I don't, um, you know, it has, of course it has aspects of composition in it, and it has aspects of tone, but, but it's not about pre-visualizing what I want this piece to look like. It's about, it's always about the idea. And so I got this paper and I was thinking, well, what do I do with it? And the obvious kind of answer to that question was origami, because it's paper folding. The word itself means literally paper oh, yeah. folding. Yeah. So some people suggested it, but I was reluctant. I didn't want to do that because it's an Asian art form, and I felt like it would be inauthentic for me to just pick it up and start using it. So I actually started making paper airplanes with this paper and exposing them to light. And I liked that idea because it seemed like it was you know, rooted in my culture, and also I became interested in ideas about play and how play had changed over the years. But it was limiting, the paper airplanes. They always looked something like the piece across from me and the piece um, two down from it. So in terms of what the results were, I found it limiting. And as it turned out, Ben Parker, 
who is, um, he's one of the top origami artists working worldwide. He's probably in the top two dozen or so. He's uh, in the process of finishing a book that's about to be published early next year. And he happened to be working in the same building that I was working in. So that was a very, very lucky kind of coincidence. And um, we, uh, we met by chance. He happened to be in the space of the common space in the collective where I work. And someone introduced us, and we right away thought about this idea of collaboration. And we ended up going right into the dark room. And we made our first piece within an hour or so of meeting each other. I went and set up the dark room, and then we tried it out. And this was the first one, so of course we were really intrigued. And um, one thing that's great about this for us is the process. I know as beginning photo students, it's really sort of a magical moment when you expose your photogram, for example, and you expose it to light and you don't see any difference in it. And then you put it in the developer bath and all of a sudden that image comes up. It's like a, a wonderful moment. And so we get that moment every time because we can't plan what this is going to look like. You'll see in the other examples where we have the scale models that in some cases you would never guess that the piece would come out looking like it does. So it's um, been a really, really interesting and fun process for us. Another thing that we really like about the work that we noticed straight off was um, when you look at it, it's hard to tell in some cases whether what you're seeing is actual folded paper, whether it's actually three-dimensional, or if there's an illusion of three-dimensionality that's based on the difference in tone. So we thought that that, we, we really were drawn to that aspect of it from the very beginning and thought that it would be an interesting experience for um, viewers to experience and look at the work. Another thing that really attracted us to the work, as I said, we couldn't really plan what the finished piece would look like, and yet there was so, such um, variety in the results that we got. And even in some cases, um, the results started to mimic different um, design uh, techniques from different periods in art history and in photo history. Um, we also were interested in, for example, this is a good example where um, people often come across this one and say it looks like architecture and it looks like an art, a specific type of architecture, which is art deco. Another thing that interested us about the work was its relationship to the photogram. It's sort of taking the photogram to its most basic application, where um, these don't even have an object. It's the light itself that is producing the image. And sometimes we describe it as the paper taking a picture of itself. And the reason the photogram interested us was that, or, or me at least, and Ben came to an understanding of photography yeah, over no time. Yeah, I knew what was going on in this one. Yeah, he, he came to it with no experience in photography at all. And we were also lucky that we were able to work together very, very easily. We, uh, we could even, um, after a time, after Ben understood more about what I was doing and I understood more about what Ben was doing, we would even make suggestions to each other, like I would say, Ben, fold this, you know, can you do this? Can you change this about a piece? Um, and Ben would have some input. He'd um, design the folded piece and then think about um, how we would expose it. So it wasn't just that Ben took the paper and folded it and handed it over to me, and then I um, exposed it and developed it. So. Um, so we started to get um, a feeling for each other's craft and uh, each other's art form. And we were interested in the photogram because of its, its place in photo history. The very first photographs, some of them were photograms. Photography wasn't invented by artists. It was invented by scientists and entrepreneurs. And um, one of the and it's even hard to say when photography was invented because it depends on how you define photography. But one of the earliest photographers, Henry, William Henry 
um, Fox Talbot, was a botanist. And he developed um, this method of working with light sensitive paper to expedite his process because what he had to do um, prior to the photography, he had to draw all these specimens of all these botanical specimens. So he was looking for a way to, um, to make that faster. And when he developed this, he, all, he actually called it the pencil of nature. So the photogram was an important part of photography from the very start. Then it got picked up in the 1920s by the surrealists, because the surrealists were very much interested in the unconscious mind. And you know how photograms seem to reveal something about those objects that is not visible to the naked eye. So that was what interested them about the photogram technique. And then it got picked up by contemporary artists, and it seemed to coincide with um, the advent of digital photography. And it's interesting, because once digital photography started to take hold, there were all sorts of movements in contemporary photography where um, artists went back and revisited historical techniques. And one explanation for that is that the history of photography is um, a technological one in some respects, that um, whatever was the current technology, the best way of producing images, that's what artists work with. And then something else came along. And then very quickly, something else came along after it. So I think one of the impetus for art, contemporary artists picking up um, the photogram again is that it's thinking about, well, all these processes are about to be taken over for, by digital. And once digital takes hold, there aren't going to be really a lot of techno technological changes in terms of what you can do in an image. Because I think people think you can do anything you want in a digital photograph. And you do have access to um, compositing and all kinds of things that traditionally photographers didn't, weren't able to have access to. So this going back to um, prior techniques, I think part of it is um, this idea that these techniques didn't get fully investigated. Um, no one got the best out of those techniques, although they got great artwork out of them. Um, it was worthwhile to sort of go back to them and fully investigate them. And I sort of think that that's true of this paper. That was The paper's designed to be folded without cracking. It was used for greeting cards. It was used for military map making so that um, the photographs could be made of um, when reconnaissance was taking place, and then they could be folded up, easily uh, transported, and, um, and shared. But no one had done this with the paper, as far as I know. And this was an, a vintage paper. The paper that we're using here expired in 1967. So it's no longer available. We're always looking for it. But um, since we, the work is about a year old. And this um, exhibition is, half of it is work from, it's the larger, the larger works are from um, last fall and this um, past spring. And the smaller ones actually were made in the past month or two. And the, uh, like the panels behind you? Right yeah. Anything in those size? So, um, so since we started with the larger size paper, this is the only paper we've been able to get that's the same. So our next move is going to be to hand coat the paper because it's not, then we can make a paper that doesn't have that clay base and it can be folded and we can use any type of paper that the emulsion will adhere to. So I don't know if some of the students are aware, but there are commercial, um, they're called liquid emulsions and they don't just adhere to paper, they adhere to glass and metal, they adhere to three dimensional objects. So, so it's something that photographers use in, um, we're sort of um, kind of it's the, the direction that we have to take it because we rarely come upon um, this vintage paper. Um, and I think maybe we can uh, then can start to talk about sure. the in influence of origami and a little bit about the uh, history of origami. Okay, so I'm, <clears throat> I'm not a photographer. 
Um, I, I take photos of my work, um, you know, so I can put it online, so I can share with other people. But God, when I was starting out, I was terrified. <laughs> I was really bad. Uh, I've been learning some of the techniques over time, and then um, since I moved my studio into a photographic resource center in Manchester, where Christine and I met, I, I've kind of through osmosis, I've, I've learned uh, a few things, and then of course we went in the dark, dark room and. Nope, all this chemistry didn't didn't mesh with me, but I knew how to fold paper. So, how many of you guys have uh, have done any kind of origami, like what you would consider origami? Okay. Um, this is typically what I work with. It's uh, just a basic hexagon. the The type of paper is called elephant hide, a bookbinding paper, um, and that's what that's what's here. That's not a light sensitive sheet. This is just the typical paper that I work with. And normally what I'll do is I'll put a grid into it. Every one of those, if you look to the, um, like the electricity molecules, some of these things, um, all the little triangles are, they have to be done by hand, because where are you gonna find paper that has all the, all the triangles done? And if I can just mention, it's done without any kind of measurements. So then it folds this very intricate um, grid of diamonds. Um, usually it's a, a diamond shape. And it's just done by folding the paper in half and then in half again by some sort of uh, tedious, <laughs> tedious yeah. technique. Um, and the ones with the grids in them are the ones that take the longest. In fact, um, there's a piece that had a grid in it that um, we no longer have. Um, it took Ben 10 hours to fold it. And he's doing it in the dark room under safe light conditions. So Fortunately, the paper wouldn't get exposed. Yeah, from it's a slow paper, so yeah. it doesn't, it's, I don't think you could do it with regular photo paper. It would, um, what's called fog, just from the safe light, you couldn't work with it that, um, for that long a period. Oh, yeah. Well, so what'll happen is uh, you get the grid in place, and you can see see these little triangles going all the way through the paper. Yeah. And uh, toss the camera. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> these little triangles going all the way through, and as you get the grid more and more dense, the triangles get smaller and smaller. Um, you can use these triangles to create overlaps in the paper. Am I? Uh, that's the metal. Okay. Overlaps in the paper called pleats, no different from uh, a pleat in a curtain or a dress or something like that, and you get these dress. So a lot of the, um, that one back there, a lot of these have twists in them. And this is typically what I work with. There's a whole other branch of tessellating called coriation, which involves um, using just the memory of the paper. So this would be considered a corrugation. You might have another uh, another thing off to the side, and it creates this mountainous effect. It's up, down, up, down. Um, and I used to work with that style. Um, I enjoyed it, um, but I kind of gave it up because the um, because I found I could do more with with you know, those pleats and overlaps. Um, the pleats are nice, and the, the, the pleat patterns, the, the flat pieces are nice, but I found, especially when we went to the dark room when we did this, that the corrugative, the, the more mountainous, sort of open tessellations worked better with this. Because if you're looking at um, this, when we, when we exposed it, this is a pleat pattern, this, this was flat when it was exposed. Exposed it, and he had these very sharp outlines of the, of the paper that was that was on the top, the top layer, and then everything else was had varying degrees under there. Whereas this is a corrugation, everything's open like this, and you get the gradation. That was cool. I really like that. So it's very important to have directional light when we're doing yeah. this because if we were to expose this just from the front, it would all, as you can imagine it would all come out sort of the same gray. There'd be a little bit of differentiation, but nowhere near what we're getting in that piece right there. And so over time, I started learning about different, different photographic techniques. And, um, like Christine said, she started learning some more origami stuff. I started learning some more photographic stuff. Um, and we started really collaborating, really saying, um, 
you know, what if you expose it like this? She would say, well, what if you form it like this? And then we ended up with the test piece. That was uh, the test strip that was over there. Um, and who work in the dark room know what a test room is, and they probably don't like doing that. Everyone considers it tedious and a chore. But um, so this piece refers to the test strip, and you can probably see how it does that. And it also refers to something in photography called the zone system, which is a highly technical, very precise way of getting the exact tones that you want in an exact area of a picture by manipulating film exposure and development. So this refers to the test strip and it also refers to the, um, to the zone system. And the way it was made was Ben uh, folded these and he made an effort to make them as um, identical as he possibly could. However, they are handmade, so if you look at them, you'll see some subtle differences, although he did an amazing job of it. So there's something interesting about the handmade in there, too. I'm sorry? I didn't know they weren't the same. Oh, no, they weren't made, uh, they weren't made by any process that would duplicate paper. Uh, setting up a, what, one, of these, one of these little, they're called molecules, or little, uh, Coordinated sections here. This is the pattern. These little, uh, I don't even know what you call them, these, these little uh, shapes, I suppose. I'll pass that around. Mm -hmm. you know, the fold, so you can, you can imagine the light hitting that and what parts catch the light, what, what parts hide the light. So one thing we thought it was interesting about this piece was what we did, obviously, to those of you who work in the darkroom, is we gave the first one a certain amount of light, and then we gave the next one a little bit more, and a little bit more, and a little bit more, until we got to this point where we actually got something that's approaching black. And if you look at it, though, remember those white areas were in shadow when the paper was exposed. So the white areas stay exactly the same throughout the sequence, and it's just the gray that gets grayer, um, darker and darker <coughs> until it gets black. And I think something interesting happened that we didn't plan is, um, and that is, if you look at the first um, example and the last example, they start to look like a positive and a negative, which is a really important part of, um, of photography. Is this a pleat or a tessellation? I'm, I'm looking mm -hmm. towards pleat because they're sharp. Well, um, most of the stuff I do is very, very sharp, you know, straight edges. So a tessellation is just a pattern. Um, or, sorry, yeah, yeah, corrugation. Corrugation, I guess. This is a corrugation. Okay. Uh, basically, so the, the thing I passed around, if you took a pin and punctured it, mm -hmm. uh, it would only go through one layer of the paper. That's corrugation. You're looking at the entire sheet right there. In the same way the light was able to creep into every aspect of this, of each of these these sheets because there's no overlap. Did you have any like complete failures? Yes. We've had a couple, but... We have, but it's surprising that we've had such a um, high success rate. Uh, occasionally, we get to areas where we start to change the work, as we did when we moved from the larger scale to the smaller scale, and that took some getting used to, and we probably had maybe a 50% success rate. And um, But in the beginning, we probably had 90%. It was, it's pretty high, yeah. And, uh, and so the, that's an interesting that you bring that up because the work, also a big part of the work is editing it. As I said, we don't know what it's gonna look like. So once it comes up, we have to decide, is this something that works with the others? Is this something that we would consider a finished piece? Um, is this something that we would, is it exhibition quality, basically? Mm -hmm. So, um, Okay. Oh, no, oh yeah, let's, let's have some questions. Oh, I was just wondering, what were the exposure times between these They're a matter of seconds, and they're not done through an enlarger. I'm using, because enlarger light wouldn't be strong enough. Okay. So what I'm using is just a regular clamp-on <laughs> light okay. with a bare bulb and um, what's called, uh, what is it called? Oh, well, it's a reflector, but it's a circular, like a half sphere. Okay. 
I like a beauty dish style. Sort of, yeah, yeah. beauty dish. <laughs> uh, I have a couple questions too sure. about the light source. Have you only used one type as your experiment? We've used two. We've used that type, which we um, we plug it into a timer, a darkroom timer, and then we've also used. Um, I've used a, a flash unit that would have been used on camera, and that we got some interesting results uh, with that because. When we used just the bare bulb, the only way we could vary the exposure was by moving it further away or closer to the paper. Whereas with the flash unit, you can vary the output of the light. You can make it um, half power or a quarter power or an eighth power. So that gave us a little more, more flexibility. The uh, newest work, however, we went back to working with, um, it's essentially a studio light, just a bulb. And, a and the next question is, while you're in the dark and folding, what are you doing? Um, um, generally, the pieces don't <laughs> the pieces don't take that long to fold. So, um, you know, it, this is also a little bit different from what intro students are using in the darkroom in that it's not RC paper. In the very beginning of the semester, we talked about just to make sure you got the right paper. There is a type of paper called RC, which stands for resin coated. And it has a plastic coating on it, which means that the processing times are fast. There are only three um, chemicals that you need, developer, stop, that fix, and then it's a rinse. This stuff is called fiber-based paper. It doesn't have that plastic coating on it. It's, everything is longer, first of all, and there are more steps involved. For example, um, just like you use a fixer remover with the, um, film that you process, I have to use a fixer remover when I process the paper. The wash times are a lot longer too. There's an initial wash of uh, five minutes and then it gets treated with fixer remover and then there's a 20 minute wash. So we're, as Ben is folding, I'm running the previous prints. The only thing we do together as far as developing is watch the print. Well, and you saw you saw how quickly I folded this. I could do another one just the same amount of time and uh, hand it off to Christine while she's developing the uh, the first one. Um, but oftentimes, I'll actually go into photosynthesis, which is the, the resource center that we work at, and I'll fold a few, or maybe I'll work on a large, complicated grid that I don't really want to spend hours the next day doing, and I'll put it in the what was it called? The box. Safe box. The safe, safe box. Okay, uh, I'll put it in there. Paper and then, safe. I'm sorry. Paper safe. Paper That's safe. right. And then the next day, Christine will come in, and then I'll just stand back. But we always do the processing and exposure mm -hmm. together, and it seems to work out in terms of the workload because I'm the one who mixes the chemistry, sets it all up, breaks it all down. So, so I don't think yeah. Ben has any complaints about no. not doing my share. <laughs> and you know, while she's doing that, I'm making coffee. So, <laughs> working on his book too. And working on my book, yes. And he makes excellent coffee, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to just go straight into a Q and A? Or yeah, let's uh, see else? if there are any uh, other questions. Anything at all? So, artists always get attached to one or two particular pieces oh. over the rest of them. What's your favorite piece that each of you? I like the electricity molecule, which is in, it's the large piece on this wall in the middle of the room. Um, I think it's so, it's just evocative. It reminds me of, um, it not only uses light in the process of making it, but in some way it refers, it evokes the idea of light. It looks like lightning. It looks like light to me. So I think that one is uh, probably my favorite. Is, uh, I'm not going to make everybody move and cameraman set up again, but um, if you go over there after the talk, there's one called the, the Snowflake uh, Flagstone with embedded crumple. Um, it looks like a snowflake. I, I like that. That's uh, actually one of my favorite designs to fold, but then we incorporate the the crumpling techniques, which uh, the one in the corner right there is, was the first crumpling study that we did. But the snowflake one is actually using it in a full pattern, which I thought was really neat. 
And if you notice what the title of that piece was, we're very lucky because, because this starts in um, geometry, we don't have to come up with names of the pieces. What we do is we name them after the fold pattern. Because it's very, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, we, um, as an artist, I don't have an easy time titling my pieces. I don't want to limit the interpretation of the piece. So that's, it's hard. Once you give it a title, um, the viewer will think about it a certain way. So, so that's a big advantage for us that we can do this kind of very dry scientific naming of the piece. Yes? The curvilinear pieces, are those made through the light hitting them and creating the sh creating the degradation, or is it because of the way that it's folded? It's actually both, it's, um, but it's folded in a circle. Because we've what we've done with the smaller pieces is we've started to work with a cutting machine, a CNC machine, and we, uh, it's a blade in the one that it's actually Ben owns it. Um, and you can adjust the depth of it. So uh, in a couple of these, we designed a pattern on screen and then cut it through the back, but not all the way through. And so um, where that, it's sort of like a scoring technique. And because of that, um, Ben can do very precise folds and he can do curves and circles. And then depending on the way it's lit, it will look either con concave or convex. So that's where the light comes into play with the circular forms. So Billy can actually, uh, we're gonna actually do some kind of curve folding like that pretty easily by hand, just with a stylus. This is what I use for a lot of my work. Um, but like Christine said, the, the click and cut, which is the, the paper cutter, uh, <coughs> oftentimes I'll, I'll, I'll use a vector program on my computer, it's called Inkscape, and design the whatever I want to design and put the paper through, slice it up. It doesn't cut all the way through, it just scores. And then you can get a really nice curvature. And that's, that's a whole other origami study that's fascinating that we, I really haven't tapped the surface of too much. So we feel at this point that we still haven't exhausted all the possibilities of this work. Even though it's very simple in a sense, it's just paper and light and chemistry, uh, we really feel like we have, as Ben said, kind of scratched the surface of what we can, what we can accomplish.